Hello, everyone. Um, um, I'm on the uh, events, community, and communications team at Aragon One. And um, I spent a lot of time thinking about Aragon community governance. So first, uh, I want to provide some background about um, how Aragon currently thinks about uh, governance, uh, community governance. So um, th I, I think of it as there being a kind of two primary uh, ways that c people can kind of participate in the Aragon project. One is through um, stigmergic coordination or permissionless self-organization. Some examples would be like anybody can create an Aragon organization. Anybody can create an Aragon app. Anybody can um, promote Aragon in their local community or organize an, uh, an Aragon meetup. Uh, these are permissionless ways of getting involved in the project and, and self-organizing to uh, kind of fulfill the project's goals. Um, but then on the other hand, there's um, this social negotiation that happens um, between people who are participating in the project. And these are ways in which people um, uh, negotiate with each other over how we use shared resources um, that are kind of owned by the project or, or owned by the Aragon network. Uh, for example, like the funds that were raised in the Aragon crowd sale or who governs the uh, Aragon organization on GitHub or you know, who manages the, the social media accounts, and so on and so forth. Um, these necessarily require um, some level or layer of permissions over who has access to these resources and how these resources are distributed. Um, and so that's that, uh, that area, the social negotiation layer, is kind of where governance comes into play. And governance is really important. Um, so the timeline for Aragon governance to date, um, I, I would say the genesis of how we've been thinking about governance starts with the V1 white paper, um, in which uh, it was written that when the network is deployed, uh, the Aragon network is deployed, governance decisions will be made by A&T holders with a system of proposals and voting. And so from the very beginning of the project, it has been, uh, it has been known and expected that a and holders would participate in the governance of the network and governance of the project. Um, so next came the community governance model, which was a pre a and governance way for the community to get involved in the governance of the project. Um, uh, next, we came out with the Aragon Manifesto, which kind of laid out like the values that uh, the, the project wants to embody and support and uphold. And I consider kind of like one of the foundational documents of Aragon governance. Um, and in uh, summer of 2018, last year, uh, a and holders uh, ratified uh, the manifesto by voting to approve and support it um, when we released uh, the survey app on mainnet. Um, and then came AGP23, uh, which was the first attempt uh, at trying to implement uh, a system where a and holders would have a more direct say in the governance of the Aragon project. So um, Luis had posted a, forum, a thread on the Aragon forum kind of pointing out that right now, or at least at the time, uh, the governance of the project was very centralized. Uh, the, the main governing body of the project was the Aragon Association, a nonprofit organization based in Switzerland. And Luis and Jorge are the board members of the association, and then the association owns uh, all, like basically all of the major uh, important resources of the Aragon project. And so, um, 
as a result, the, the project has, has, ha, would have a very centralized governance model where it pretty much depends entirely on the good graces of the association um, and, and Luis and Jorge as a result. So the idea was that we would come up with, with a new model where a and holders would be able to um, ratify or veto decisions that the association was making with these resources that it owned. And that was AGP 23, uh, under the old uh, community governance model. Um, but then came AGP 1, which was kind of a reboot of the governance process, because the original um, Aragon community governance model was relatively informal and unstructured in the way that we decided like what should even be worthy of an AGP, or how do people create AGPs? What makes a good AGP or a bad AGP? Um, we didn't have answers to those questions at the time under the original governance model, so we came out with a, a new draft of a new uh, foundational document for governance called AGP-1. AGP-1 basically defines the, the new and current uh, Aragon governance proposal process. Um, and you can read the document online if you're interested in, in kind of going deeper into that. Um, in November of last year, uh, AGP-1 was ratified by a and holders in a vote uh, after Aragon went live on the Ethereum mainnet. Uh, we held a vote on November, starting on November 15th, and it was passed. Uh, uh, overwhelmingly, a and holders voted to approve AGP-1, and so now this is like the current uh, process that we use for, for Aragon community governance. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what AGP-1 uh, what AGP-1 is and how it works. So uh, AGP is short for Aragon Governance Proposal. Uh, this is a document that is drafted by community members, um, reviewed by the Aragon Association, and then finally put to a vote by Aragon Network Token holders. Um, this is kind of a, a flowchart of the basic uh, process. So there are currently five stages in the Aragon governance proposal process. Uh, stages one through three, community members are drafting proposals, reviewing proposals, giving feedback. Um, once the proposal is finalized, it goes on to an uh, a review by the Aragon Association. The association makes sure that the proposal isn't doing anything uh, weird or malicious or just kind of like off topic. Um, and it will approve or, or reject the proposal based on, based on the quality uh, of the proposal. And then uh, all of the proposals that the association uh, ap approves uh, go on to a final vote by a and holders. And a and holders have a chance to either approve uh, the proposals or to reject them. And the ones that get rejected go back to the beginning of the process. The ones that get approved uh, get executed, either by the author of the proposal or by the association. Um, so the AGP argument surface, as, uh, as I like to call it, uh, is, is like all of the areas in which uh, that, that are covered by the Aragon governance proposal process. So first we have the association track AGPs, which cover Aragon association policies. You can think of these like um, policies about um, Sit maybe maybe the employment policies of the association, or maybe the way the policies that the association has for its social media channels, like uh, uh, the code of conduct or the communications guidelines, or really any kind of uh, like corporate uh, policies of the association. Um, there's the the finance track AGPs, which cover uh, funding, uh, how the association is spending money. Uh, including funding uh, flock teams um, or, or any, really any uh, transfers out of the association multi-sig that holds funds that were raised in the crowd sale. Um, there are uh, Metatrack AGPs, which basically uh, are um, AGPs that modify the governance process itself, or, or as I say here, governing governance. 
And then there are the proclamation track AGPs, which were kind of put in mostly for fun, but this is kind of a way to give ANT uh, voters a, a voice so they can make proclamations. Like ANT holders can vote on a proclamation track AGP that says something like, we support this particular EIP, or we want to uh, denounce this action by some uh, member of the community or something like that. Um, and, then and then there's the ANT vote. So th the, the parameters of the ANT vote are pretty simple. Uh, we have uh, no minimum quorum, so any number of tokens uh, can vote and, and it would be a, a valid uh, vote. Finance or association, finance, and proclamation track proposals require 50% uh, support, and then the meta track proposals to actually modify the governance process itself uh, require a two-thirds, a greater than two-thirds uh, majority approval. Um, so the l for the last part of the presentation, I'll talk about uh, the future of Aragon community governance. Um, all of this is, is just kind of ideas. Um, right now, we're, we're sticking with what we have in, in AGP1, but these are some ideas of, of directions that we could go uh, if we decide that the, the process needs to be modified. So we could amend the argument surface to cover also things like the ANT uh, supply policy or monetary policy, if you will. Um, uh, expanding the ANT supply or contracting the ANT supply. Um, we could gov uh, add in governance over software upgrades. We could add in a track for Aragon Network court rules and parameters once the Aragon Network is live. Um, and we could govern other Aragon Network services in addition to the court. Uh, if we come up with other uh, services. Um, we could also implement new governance models other than just pure like ANT voting. For example, uh, delegated voting, where ANT holders would be able to delegate their vote to another member of the community, um, another Ethereum account or another ANT holder. For example, there could be a uh, and a cooperative of Aragon community members uh, that have like a one member, one vote model. Um, this has actually been implemented since I made this slide. Um, and, then, and, and so ANT holders could delegate their vote to that if they prefer a more democratic kind of model of governance. Um, and then other communities might prefer to delegate their vote to people who they consider experts in the community, such as Aragon developers. Um, we could have a bicameral system of governance where instead of just ANT holders being the only uh, governors in the system, there could also be some sort of like reputation governance and uh, proposals will only be approved if both the ANT holders and the reputation holders agree. Uh, there could be a uh, Futarchy. Um, you heard from Level K earlier who talked about the, the Futarchy app that they're working on. Uh, they explained how it basically works, but we could have, you know, a question that's like, you know, if approved, will policy X result in a higher ANT price by, by this date? Uh, if, the, if the prediction market comes up with an answer of no, then the proposal gets rejected. If the prediction market comes up with an answer of yes, then it gets approved. This is obviously a simplified explanation, but you get the idea. So what else could we do? Well, you tell me. I'm really interested in hearing from the uh, people in the Aragon community who have ideas about how we can improve the Aragon uh, governance proposal process. Uh, so you can come up and talk to me personally, but even better, you could create a thread on the Aragon forum uh, and, and, and start a discussion so that we can all kind of partake uh, in, in improving Aragon community governance. Um, so, the last step in the timeline here that I want to talk about is Aragon network vote number one. So I mentioned that Aragon, uh, the Aragon governance proposal process was ratified by ANT holders back in November, 
And we actually had a vote that was scheduled uh, for just last week. Um, it was originally scheduled for a couple weeks before that, but Ethereum almost f hard forked, and so we were like, we should probably delay the vote uh, just in case. Um, and then the hard fork got delayed anyway, so uh, <laughs> it's just funny how it turns out. But we had the vote, it was very successful. A bunch of ANT holders participated, and uh, so now I want to kind of reveal to you guys what proposals they voted on and what were the results of the vote. These were the proposals that were approved uh, by ANT holders. Uh, AGP5, which was flock, uh, uh, funding for flock funding for Aragon 1. Uh, AGP10, which was an idea for a, a community funding DAO, uh, which is a DAO governed by ANT holders that would allocate small amounts of funding to community projects, like really anything, but it could, f it could sponsor a meetup, or it could sponsor uh, uh, creating an Aragon infographic, or anything. I think it has a budget of $12,500 per quarter. Um, so the AGP 11, which was the Aragon Association 2019 budget, was approved. Um, this, was, this is just the annual budget for the association. Uh, AGP 12, which was an Aragon holiday. Um, Luis uh, uh, decided to write AGP 12 uh, to make an official Aragon holiday on the day that uh, Aragon was announced, February 10th. Uh, so it's officially Aragon Day now. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or uh, Fight for Freedom Day, I think, I think it was. Um, so yeah, February 10th, get ready to celebrate with us. And, uh, AGP 14, which was a proposal that I wrote to improve the, some of the, a meta proposal that I wrote to, to improve some of the voting logistics, because uh, we realized through the process of actually running uh, the governance process that there were some things that could be improved. Um, AGP 17, which was the NEST 2019 budget for the Aragon NEST uh, grants program. Thank you, ANT holders, for approving that because, uh, as you saw from all the presentations earlier, NEST teams have been working on some very, uh, very exciting and valuable projects. Um, AGP 18, which is the Aragon Network Security par Partner proposal uh, that was presented by Authio, uh, and, and they ended up bringing in uh, consensus diligence to help them so that they could do um, uh, security audits for Aragon software. Um, and finally, uh, AGP 19, which is uh, the Autark Flock funding proposal. So we have a new team that's working full-time on Aragon because ANT holders approved their proposal. Uh, welcome. Autark to the Aragon Flock program. Um, and there was only one proposal that got rejected, which was AGP 16, which was a proposal to extend the, the voting p uh, duration from 48 hours, which it currently is, to one week. Um, th there wasn't too much discussion about, uh, about this, but uh, in any case, uh, it, anti holders decided that 48 hours is enough time rather than uh, having like seven full days of voting. Um, I just want to remark on how, how amazing it is that ANT holders were able to kind of come together and coordinate to, to, to work on these things. And it didn't just end up being, it, there was like a lot of back and forth uh, in, in, in several of the proposals throughout the, the voting period as well. So it wasn't you know, a complete landslide across the board, just everyone in agreement. There was some, there was some, uh, there was some real uh, challenges to some of the proposals. And if you go back and look at the discussions on the forum, uh, you can see that reflected in the comments that people were making. So thanks to everyone that participated in the, in the, in the governance process, reviewing the proposals, writing the proposals, uh, and, and finally voting on the proposals. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over for questions. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Does anyone have questions about Aragon community governance? Oh, we have one. This is kind of sketchy, but... <laughs> oh! So, why is the association review part important, and isn't that like a huge centralization factor? Yeah, um, a good question. So, why is the association review important? So, 
backtracking a little bit, I mentioned that in the AGP1 process, the uh, proposals are created by the community, then they're reviewed by the association and voted on by the association, and then finally, the ones that the association approves, a and holders vote on. So why is there that middle step? Um, and the reason for that is because um, without having some sort of like quality check on proposals, uh, you could end up with a situation where a uh, somebody could like buy up a bunch of a and and either pass or reject uh, important proposals. So they could pass a proposal that like sends all of the money to their own address, or they could reject a proposal that's like funding all of the core teams. Both would be extremely detrimental to and, and destructive to the project, um, and so there needs to be this kind of like curation layer. Uh, to, to prevent like either like obviously bad or, or, or malicious or otherwise like off topic kind of proposals from, from getting to the final ballot. Um, in the future, this step will be fulfilled by the Aragon court system. And the Aragon court system will rely on the Aragon manifesto and other kind of founding, founding or foundational uh, values documents uh, to, to assess like the quality of proposals. Uh, but for right now, the association is kind of like standing in uh, and filling that role of the network until the network is live. Is that, yeah. Uh, so uh, did I see that 7% uh, of the token holders voted for like one of the AGPs? Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, so yeah, my question is, uh, I'm sure there are at least some people who are holding ANDs just for like speculation or just like selling them off, holding them. Uh, do you think there's a way to incentivize these kind of people to actually participate in the votes or, or sell those tokens to people who actually want to participate? Um, it's, tough, it's tough to say. Um, I mean, like, you could, pay you could pay people to vote, but then they might just vote on nonsense and, 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 and their vote won't be very, a very good signal. So the way that I think of it right now is, like, if, if people show up to vote, then like, you know, like their decision probably is important. It matters. Um, and the people that abstain from voting, uh, they're just not participating in the process. They're kind of along for the ride. Um, I'm, I, I'm optimistic that implementing things like delegated voting will uh, give an opportunity for at least the, the people who choose to remain passive to delegate their vote to somebody who might be more active more knowledgeable about about the proposals that are being uh, being considered. So while I don't think that directly incentivizing voting is the right way to go, I do think that providing a way for passive holders to still participate in the governance process would be valuable. So I'm looking forward to seeing delegated voting, um, at least experimenting with delegated voting. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. And if anybody else has ideas about how to engage the passive uh, ANT holders that I'm certainly open to ideas. A and we have a few more minutes, so maybe one or two more questions. I had one question. I actually have two. What was your participation rate in the different votes you had? And did you find that there was a difference in the, the vote that was rejected and the votes that were actually accepted? That's my first question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so the maximum participation that we saw in terms of like the number of uh, tokens that voted out of the total supply of tokens that are out there was I think around seven and a half percent, and and the lowest I think was around two and a half percent. And what would you think would be ideal? I mean, what is your aim? That seems like a really low percentage to me. Um, in terms of organizations and voting, if you look at shareholders' meetings, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I haven't. Uh, I, I mean, I, ha I don't even know what to expect in terms of what's realistic to okay. expect. Um, so I, I, it's, I think we are kind of figuring out what the benchmarks are, like as we go in terms of like what, what, what we hope to see. Like if you look at, if you compare it to say, national elections or something like that, like 50% turnout's really good. Um, so, uh, but then if you look at like a local city government election, like more than 10% is like pretty, pretty good turnout. So, you know, I think contextually speaking, we're still figuring out what actually, what's good and, and, and what's kind of 
uh, versus like what's unrealistic to expect. Like maybe something more than 50% is just unrealistic to expect. But yeah, we're, we're kind of seeing as we go. Yeah, and, and then I guess my s second question, you kind of alluded to the court system. Mm -hmm. And in legacy court systems, you have jurisprudence. And I was just wondering, in forming your governance and your voting, would you consider embedding a system that's similar to that? Repeat the question, please. <laughs> I would say in our legacy court systems, mm -hmm. um, when you are having a verdict or a vote or a jury is making a decision, you have jurisprudence, which basically is looking at laws that have been voted on in the past. And I'm just wondering if you can, and, and that's a very big part of the, the legal, leg the legacy system we have now in legal mm -hmm. proceedings. And I was just wondering if you can embed that for decision makings by the juries or by the people who are voting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's, that's totally possible. Um, it, would, it would really depend on, I think, the jurors to decide what they want to use as a reference for how they like to inform their decisions. Um, so like they might, they might use uh, past decisions that were made by the court, or they might look at like even like traditional common law. Um, but but uh, that's all like still very much remains to be defined. I think. Thank you. Yeah, but I I would encourage any que if you have like you know more questions about the court and stuff. Uh, Bing and and Luke they did a presentation earlier about the network. Um, they they would be good to talk to about the court. And I think that's that's time. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>